Good morning. Waymaker to me is a great theme song for prayer. Even when I don't see it, even when I don't feel it, you're working. And that is something we have to strongly believe. I find it's an incentive. It helps me to pray to realize that God is going to respond, somehow use my time with him, my time in prayer, to make a difference. Some difference. A difference in me, a difference in others, a difference for those I'm praying for, or the situations that I'm praying about. Because he is the way maker, the promise keeper, the light in the darkness. I do think we need incentive to prayer. Prayer is hard work. We live in a day when there are so many uh, attractive things, pleasurable things, things that are fun to do, things that are distracting and entertaining. Prayer is hard work. What's the payoff? If we don't believe there's a payoff, <laughs> how are we going to drag ourselves to prayer? That's why remembering that the Lord is the way maker, the peacekeeper, the light in the darkness, and that there is a promise to prayer. I can't tell you that that promise is the promise that you want to hear. But the promise of prayer in my heart is that when I pray, it makes a difference. And I want you to be thinking about that. Because the word, the scripture, the New Testament in particular, calls us to prayer. It calls us to devote ourselves to prayer. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. I do believe that. I think you do too. Sometimes we're not conscious of it or aware of it. We maybe aren't kind of filled with an awareness that God is at work in our world and around us in ways that we should become more enchanted by see him at work in our lives and the lives of people around us in the affairs and events of life. Hear his voice. Do you recognize his voice? His voice always reminds me of the voice of Jesus Christ. His will always reminds me of the will of Jesus Christ, the character of Jesus Christ the good news of Jesus Christ, the joy, the peace, the forgiveness, the thanksgiving, the kindness, the gentleness, the spirit of Jesus Christ, the spirit that has been poured out on us, that indwells us. They are not inactive. It may be, though, that sometimes we're dulled to these things because of all the other things that fill our minds and hearts the things that fill our eyes and our affections and our feelings. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You are here, moving in our midst, working in this place, touching every heart, mending and healing every heart, turning lives around. That's the promise of prayer, because that's what God does. That's who God is. That's who God is. That's the promise of prayer. This morning we're in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. I'd like to read it to you. This is the Apostle Paul. The Church of Colossae is a, a young church. Paul writes 
as he's closing out his letter. This is, so to speak, the beginning of the end. These are the final remarks. So he leaves them with this. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us also that God may open a door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains so that I may make it known as I should. Paul thinks that if they pray for him, it makes a difference. He wants them to pray for him because it makes a difference. He's going to be making these efforts to be a witness for Jesus Christ. To put the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ into words. And he says, if, if you pray for me, it'll make a difference. I need it. I need your prayer." Devote yourself to prayer is a really strong request. Paul expects us to give greater importance to prayer than our most cherished use of time. And that's hard. You know, I wanted to do this series, series on prayer not because... I'm an expert prayer. I'm not the best prayer here. I'm not doing this because I need to tell you of all my success in prayer. I'm doing this series on prayer because I believe we're all in need of doing a better job of praying. And I want us to join in this. This has been very moving for me over the weeks. I hope it has stirred you. I hope the Spirit has lit a, struck a spark in your soul to be thinking about prayer, the presence of the Lord, an ongoing conversation and awareness and interaction with the Lord. There is a promise implied, isn't there? Isn't there when, when Paul says, devote yourself to pray, prayer? And I mean, I couldn't even quote to you all the verses from Paul's letters, for example, or Peter or others, where they tell us to pray continually. To really invest ourselves in effort in prayer. Why would they do that if there's no point in it? If it doesn't make a difference? Make room for prayer. Devote yourself to prayer. The word expresses a tenacious persistence which overcomes anything in the way of prayer. Continue strenuously in prayer is one translation. I have to develop some new muscles in prayer to pray like this. I do find it easier for myself. I want, I want to try and be as transparent as possible because I am not setting myself up as the master class example of what a prayer looks like. But I find it easier to just be aware of the Lord and, and kind of prayer and think about people and situational prayer throughout the day, but I'm trying to set aside time to pray. Paul uses the same verb in Romans 12, 12, persist. In other words, you have this kind of tenacious, I'm not going to let go, I'm going to continue in prayer. This is important to me. This is a priority. I hope you have your bulletin with you. Today's bulletin. 
I put something in there for us. I want you to pray with me this week, at least once a day. On the back of the prayer of the notes, there's a prayer. And I thought we could be praying this together this week. It's a very simple prayer. It's it's worded as I would pray it or as you would pray it. It's you don't have to stick exactly to the prayer. You could add lines of prayer. I'm sure there are many more concerns on our heart than are reflected in this sheet. But even as we've touched on weekly the fact that we're not far from entering our new ministry center. And I thought if we were all praying, maybe not in lockstep, but if our hearts were united in praying, some common requests, concerns, reflections, praises, and expressions of prayer such as we have here, that would be a precious thing. What might God do between now and then? Do in our neighborhoods. Do in our lives. Do in the lives of those that we come in contact with. Something like this can help us because it gives us a target and some focus so that we can be tenacious. And if we know others are engaged with us each day, it, it's an incentive to add our voice and our heart and our soul to the enterprise of beseeching the Lord as he asks us and encourages us to do. It's costly to pray. In 2 Samuel 24, 24, David has sinned against the Lord. He wants to make amends. He wants a threshing floor on which to build an altar unto the Lord to sacrifice offerings of atonement. So he goes to Aruna, and Aruna sees the king, King David and his entourage, making their way to him. And he runs out to meet him. He does obeisance. He falls and presses his head, forehead, to the ground before David. He asks, what has brought you to, to me? And David tells him of his desire. And Aruna says, I'll supply everything. I'll even supply not only the stone for the altar, I'll not only supply the threshing floor, I'll supply the oxen, the wood, the servants, everything for you, David. And I know many of you have read this and you know what David says. He said, I have to pay for all this. It has to cost me. He says, I insist for I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. Prayer is an offering that costs us something, and it's precious to the Lord. We're to devote ourselves to prayer. I'm trying to do that. I want you to join me in this. We'll struggle. We'll be sometimes distracted. We'll find it hard. But you'll notice that Paul says here, be watchful, be alert. And that's very important. That's the first thing that we need to include in our notion of prayer that's devoted. It's not just being, the word can be used of physically awake as opposed to asleep. And sometimes Prayer puts us to sleep. But this is to be not only physically awake, but to be awake spiritually, awake unto the Lord, aware and awake and alert unto spiritual things. And I do find prayer does that. It reorients my whole outlook. It's almost like my head has popped through the clouds and I have entered heaven because I see 
in a sense, I have a comprehension of all reality, not just this material world. And we see that side of it in our society that has no space in their thinking, no belief in their heart for God. They are atheistic. There is no supernatural. But when we pray, there's a new reality compared to that which our world is buying into. And that reality is the reality of God and the spiritual world. The world in which Jesus Christ is our Redeemer, who died and rose from the dead and poured out his Spirit that calls us children and says that we belong to him. Our, our lives are not without meaning. Our lives are bonused with meaning. We count in ways other people can't even comprehend. All of that is open to us in prayer. Augustine, Augustine, who is the father of much of our theology, I don't even know and understand how a man can write as much as he did and so powerfully and in many ways flawlessly. His influence on theology has been powerful, but it's all rooted in the Word. He was converted. He had this conversion moment where he, where he paused by an open book, and it was open to Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. But the most important thing that he saw was, this is this is the year, this is the day, this is the time of what God's doing. And then it says, wake up, rouse yourself from the darkness of this world and live in the light. That's the kind of an awareness of reality, an alertness that we're talking about. It's not a physical light, although that's a great symbol, and it triggers our imagination to understand the illumination of the mind, heart, and soul, which is what we're talking about here, that is large enough to contain things that will not fit into this material world. That is our world, and it's our world at its best in prayer. And God speaks, and we hear. And what we think is not limited or grounded by this material world. In prayer, we're alert to the truth, to the presence of God. And prayer brings clarity. It faces us with our own heart in a way that the world will never cause us to stand up to our to our own heart and see it as it really is. Our heart looks pretty good when we compare it to this world and we think about the values and pursuits and affections of this world. We fit right in. We're cozy as can be. But in prayer, we have to face the reality of our hearts in a way we're never forced to face our hearts in this world. That's an important part of our spiritual lives each and every day. That's where transformation begins and change occurs. When we rearrange and recalibrate the affections of our heart so they align and pair with the heart and affections of our Lord. 
God's love, holiness, and lordship become real to us in prayer. Prayer puts our earthly heroes in perspective. We do have our earthly heroes. But in prayer, those heroes, our earthly politics, our earthly goals and accomplishments, they all find their appropriate place and value in prayer. And because they do, change in our heart takes place. Clarification in our heart takes place in prayer. So it's very important to be watchful, to be alert, to be awake in the act of prayer to spiritual things, to the things of the Lord. And to be grateful, he says, with thanksgiving. We're to pray with an attitude of thanksgiving. If we're alert in prayer, we become aware of the Lord, and that just naturally humbles us. I don't think I'm just speaking for myself. It naturally humbles us. And when we're humble, we begin to realize that we're not all that. We see ourselves more clearly. We realize that the Lord has brought, through his grace, so much goodness into our lives, through other people. I mean, we're not self-made. We're God-made. And that brings thanksgiving. It brings gratitude. And it brings joy and peace. It's good that we don't have to achieve everything ourselves. It's good to realize how much help and goodness comes our way, not by our own efforts, but by grace, God's goodness. The more we become grateful and thankful, the more we become more aware of the Lord. I do believe gratitude is a secret to the Christian life. I believe gratitude is a secret to discipleship, of achievement, of joy, of peace, of happiness, of every good thing in this world. It's also the secret of worship and praise and thanksgiving because we realize how much God has been gracious to us. And we know that because of Jesus Christ. And it opens our eyes and our world to everything else. We should be a grateful, thankful, praising people. Not bitter, sour, shriveled up, deserving, and blind to all of God's goodness in our lives. You ever pray for a parking spot? <laughs> There's a story. An attorney was late for a very important appointment. She kept circling the parking lot. Finally, she raised her eyes. She said, Lord, have pity on me. If you help me find a parking space, I'll promise to go to church every Sunday. I'll even give up chocolate. All of a sudden, there was miraculously a parking space appeared. And she said, never mind, I found one. <laughs> How often do we explain away things that are just as well, if not better explained, as the work of God, an answer to our heart's desires? But we're blind to see it. We are affected, and I, I, I'm more of a kind of scientific guy, a, a strict historian, facts, being able to root out the source of things and know it for myself. That is the kind of person I am. But we have to open our hearts to the things that when we're praying about them and they happen, we erupt in thanksgiving, recognition, and praise. 
We have to give the Lord more credit for the things that we see going on in our lives instead of, man, that was some coincidence. Paul never fails to mention. Last week, Ephesians 5.20, give thanks always for everything to God. Philippians 4.6, don't worry about anything. Present your requests to the Lord with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving. I think, and I know some of you have heard me say this before, but it really does bear repeating. If you will give thanks, if you will open your heart and express thanksgiving to the Lord in your trial, in your difficulty, in your sadness, in your upset, in your worry, it will make room for you to see God at work. Because when we're sad or angry or upset, we want God to work just our way. But God sometimes has bigger ways to bring bigger blessings into our lives. And when we start to give thanks, we have the clarity of sight to see God at work in ways that are larger than our little request that we're waiting on him to fulfill. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Listen to this. Rejoice when you get a chance. Rejoice always. Always. Pray constantly. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything. For this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. I let me repeat that. First Thessalonians 5. 16, 17, and 18. In Colossians, the very letter that we're in this morning, in the third chapter, the 17th verse, Paul says, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, through Jesus, in Jesus' name. And then a third thing here in verse 3 and 4, be helpful. You know, I wanted them to rhyme, right? A watchful, grateful, helpful. Helpful, though, just means that I'm going to help you by praying for you. I'm going to intercede. In other words, I'm going to stand, so to speak, between the Lord and you, and I'm going to pray on your behalf. I'm going to carry your need, my concern for you, to the Lord on your behalf. I'm going to help you. That makes our prayer helpful. And that's what Paul asks them for. Pray for me. I believe if you pray for me, says Paul, he will help me as I seek to lead a life that brings him honor, praise, and glory. As I seek to speak for him, if you pray, he will help me do the very job that I desire to do. I believe in prayer. It's hard, but it is a gift unto the Lord because he knows it's hard. And when he sees us coming to him in prayer, humble, dependent, grateful, thankful. I don't think there's a thing we can do that would touch God more and express our love for him. God does answer prayer. There are things I can't explain. My mom died at, 90, at, at 45 years of age. I still have a very distinct picture of her praying in her room after she had had brain surgery and was partially paralyzed.
my father had left us. So, yeah, in one year, her husband leaves her, says he doesn't love her anymore, and she has to go back to school. She has to find a way to support her son and daughter, and she does, and she becomes a grade school teacher. And then she's having these horrible headaches, and she's diagnosed with brain cancer. And so they perform surgery, but it has metastasized. That means it's just sent little roots throughout the brain, and there's no way that they can help her by surgery or medication. And then she spends the next year in an almost comatose state where I talk to her, read the Bible to her, pray over her, and all she can do is answer with her eyes. But I have that distinctive memory of her praying in the midst of all of that. Thanking the Lord for all of his goodness. That faith that I witnessed when she was on her knees was the faith that led me to devote my life to the Lord. Because all of us need a Lord like that. Let me pray for us. Gracious Heavenly Father, we will never feel like um, we do enough for you, pray well enough. But we're deeply grateful for your son, Jesus Christ. We're so grateful for the regular 24-7 assistance of your Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Our prayer this morning is that we would attune our hearts to you, Lord, and that we would come before you more frequently and continuously because we want to devote ourselves to you and devote ourselves to you in prayer. We pray this in Jesus' matchless name, and all of God's people said,